Fan Voyage 2, Destination Brain By Isaac Asimov Audiobook 6 of 26 It is uncertain how far we can extrapolate such information to the much more complex structure of the human brain. I admit I haven't worked with the human brain anatomically, but I have analyzed human brain waves carefully and those results are at least consistent with my creative structure hypothesis. This is what I haven't been able to duplicate and what American researchers may not have been able to duplicate, either. Again Morrison shrugged. Adequate brain wave analysis is, at best, a monumentally difficult thing at the Cantonary level and no one else has given the years to the problem that I have or possesses the particular computerized equipment. You have designed your own program for the purpose of brainwave analysis, haven't you? Yes, I have. And described it in the literature. Certainly. If I achieved results with an undescribed program, they would be worth nothing. Who could confirm my results, lacking an equivalent computer program? Yet I have heard at the International Neurophysical Conference in Brussels last year, that you are continually modifying your program and complaining that the lack of confirmation stems from the use of insufficiently complex programming incapable of Fourier analysis to the proper degree of sensitivity. No, Yuri, that is false. Entirely false. I have modified my program from time to time but I have carefully described each modification in computer technology. I have tried to publish the data in the American Journal of Neurophysics, but they haven't accepted my papers these last few years. If others confine their reading to the AJN and don't keep up with relevant literature elsewhere, that is not my fault. And yet... Dash Konyev paused and frowned in what seemed to be uncertain thought. I don't know if I ought to say this because it may be something else that will antagonize you. Go ahead. I have, in these last few years, learned to accept all kinds of remarks hostile, sarcastic, and, worst of all, pitying. I am quite hardened to it. This is good chicken Kiev, by the way. This is a guest meal, murmured Kahinan almost under her breath. Too buttery. Bad for the figure. Ha, said Dezhnyov loudly. Bad for the figure. That is an American remark that makes no sense in Russian. My father always said, the body knows what it needs. That's why some things taste good. Kahinan closed her eyes in quite obvious distaste. A recipe for suicide, she said. Morrison noticed that Konyev did not look at the young woman during this bit of byplay. Not at all. He said, you were saying, Yuri? About something that might antagonize me, you thought. Konyev said, well, then, is it true, Albert, or not true that you actually gave your program to a colleague and that, using it in your computer, he was still unable to duplicate your results? That's true, said Morrison. At least my colleague, an able enough man, said he could not duplicate my results. Do you suspect he was lying? No. Not really. It's just that the observations are so delicate that to attempt them while certain of failure may well lead, it seems to me, to failure. Might one not argue the other way around, Albert? and say that your certainty of success leads you to imagine success. Possibly, said Morrison. That has been pointed out to me several times in the past. But I don't think so. One more rumor, said Konyev. This I truly hate to repeat, but it seems so important. Is it true that you have claimed that in your analysis of brain waves you have occasionally sensed actual thoughts? Morrison shook his head vigorously. I have never made such a claim in print. I have said to a colleague, once or twice, that in concentrating on the brain wave analysis there are occasionally times when I seem to find thoughts invading my mind. 
I have no way of telling whether the thoughts are entirely mine or whether my own brain waves resonate to those of the subject. Is such a resonance conceivable? I suppose so. The brain waves produce tiny fluctuating electromagnetic fields. Ah! It is this, I suppose, that made academician Shaparov make that remark about a relay station. Brain waves are always producing fluctuating electromagnetic fields. With or without analysis. You don't resonate. If resonance is what it is. To the thoughts of someone in your presence, no matter how intensely he may be thinking. The resonance takes place only when you are busily studying the brain waves with your programmed computer. It presumably acts as a relay station magnifying or intensifying the brain waves of the subject and projecting them into your mind. I have no evidence for that except for an occasional fugitive impression. That's not enough. It might be. The human brain is far more complex than any other equivalent piece of matter we know of. What about dolphins? Said Dezhnyov, his mouth full. An exploded view, said Konyev at once. They're intelligent, but their brains are devoted too entirely to the minutiae of swimming to allow enough room for abstract thought on the human scale. I have never studied dolphins, said Morrison indifferently. Ignore the dolphins, said Konyev impatiently. Just concentrate on the fact that your computer, properly programmed, may act as a relay station, passing thoughts from the mind of the subject you are studying to your own mind. If that is so, Albert, we need you and no other person in the world. Morrison said, frowning and pushing his chair away from the table, even if I can pick up thoughts by way of my computer. A claim I have never made and which, in fact, I deny. What can that possibly have to do with miniaturization? Boronova rose and looked at her watch. It is time, she said. Let us go and see Shaparov now. Morrison said, what he says will make no difference to me. You will find, said Boronova with a hint of steel in her voice, that he will say nothing. But will be utterly convincing just the same. 21. Morrison had kept his temper well so far. The Soviets were, after all, treating him as a guest and if he could overlook the small matter of his being carried off by force, he had little of which to complain. But what were they getting at? One by one, Boronova had introduced him to others. First Dezhnyov, then Kahinin, then Konyev. For reasons he had not penetrated. Over and over, Boronova had hinted of his usefulness without actually saying what it might be. Now Konyev talked of it and was equally uncommunicative. And now they were to see Shaparov. Clearly this had to be a climax of sorts. From the first mention of him by Boronova at the convention two days ago, Shaparov had seemed to hover over the whole matter like a thickening fog. It was he who had worked out the miniaturization process, he who seemed to detect a connection between Planck's constant and the speed of light he who seemed to value Morrison's neurophysical theories, and he who made the remark about the computer as relay station that had apparently set off Konyev's conviction that Morrison, and only Morrison, could help them. It remained for Morrison, now, to resist any blandishments or arguments that Shaparov could present. If Morrison insisted that he would not help them, what would they do when all the blandishments and arguments had failed? Crude threat of force. Or torture. Brainwashing? Morrison quailed. He dared not put his refusal on the basis that he would not. He would have to persuade them that he could not. Surely that was a reasonable position on which to take his stand. What could neurophysics? And a dubious, unaccepted bit of neurophysical work at that. Have to do with miniaturization? But why didn't they see that for themselves? Why did they all act as though it were conceivable that a person like himself, who had never as much as thought of miniaturization until some 48 hours before, could do something for them? 
them, the only experts in the field. That they could not do for themselves? It was a rather lengthy walk along corridors and, lost in his own uncomfortable thoughts, Morrison did not notice that they were fewer in number than he had thought. He said to Boronova suddenly, Where are the others? She said, They have work to do. We do not have forever to do what we must, you know. Morrison shook his head. Chatty, they were not. None of them seemed to scatter information. Always close-lipped. A long-standing Soviet habit, perhaps. Or something that was ground into them through their work on a secret project in which even the scientists dared not step outside the narrow limits of their immediate work. Were they coming to him as a storybook American generalist? Nothing he had ever done, surely, would give anyone that impression. As a matter of fact, he was himself a narrow specialist, knowing virtually nothing outside of neurophysics. This was a worsening disease of modern science, he thought. They had entered another elevator, something he had scarcely bothered to notice, and they were now on another level. He looked around him and recognized characteristics that seemed to transcend national differences. Are we in a medical wing? He asked. A hospital, said Boronova. The grotto is a self-contained scientific complex. And why are we here? Am I? Dash he stopped suddenly, as the horror of the thought smote him. Was he to be drugged or, by some other medical means, made more compliant? Boronova had walked on for a moment, then stopped, looked back, and came toward him, saying snappishly, Now what is frightening you? Morrison felt ashamed. Were his facial expressions that transparent? Nothing is frightening me, he grumbled. I am simply tired of walking aimlessly. What makes you think we are walking aimlessly? I said we were going to see Pyotr Shaparov. We are walking toward him now. Come, we have only a few steps left. They turned a corner and Boronova beckoned him to a window. He stepped to her side and looked in. It was a room and there were a number of people present. There were four beds, but only one was occupied and it was surrounded by equipment that he did not recognize. There were tubes and glassware extending toward the bed and Morrison counted a dozen functionaries, who might be doctors, nurses, or medical technicians. Boronova said, there is academician Shaparov. Which one? Said Morrison his eyes traveling from one of the figures to the other and finding no one who seemed similar in appearance to the scientist he recalled having met once. In the bed. In the bed? He's ill, then. Worse than ill. He is in a coma. He has been in a coma for over a month and we strongly suspect it is an irreversible state. I'm terribly sorry to hear that. I presume that is why you referred to him in the past tense before lunch. Yes, the shaper of we know is in the past tense, unless... Dash unless he recovers? But you just said the coma is probably irreversible. That's true. But neither is he brain dead. The brain is damaged certainly or he wouldn't be in a coma, but it is not dead and Konyev, who has followed your work closely thinks that some of his thinking network is still intact. Ah, said Morrison, the light breaking. I begin to understand. Why didn't you explain this to begin with? If you had wanted to consult me on such a matter and had explained, I might have been willing to come here with you voluntarily. Yet, on the other hand, if I were to study his cerebral functioning and tell you, yes, Yuri Konyev is right, then what good will that do you? That will do us no good at all. You don't yet begin to understand, you see, and I can't explain exactly what it is I want until you understand the problem. Do you quite realize what is buried there in the still living portions of Shaparov's brain? His thoughts, I suppose. Specifically, 
his thoughts of the interconnection of Planck's constant and the speed of light. His thoughts of a method for making miniaturization and demiaturization rapid, low energy, and practical. With those thoughts, we give humanity a technique that will revolutionize science and technology. And society. More than anything since the invention of the transistor. Perhaps more than anything since the discovery of fire. Who can tell? Are you sure you're not being overdramatic? No, Albert. Does it occur to you that if miniaturization can be tied in with a vast acceleration of the speed of light, a spaceship, if sufficiently miniaturized, can be sent to anywhere in the universe at many times the ordinary speed of light? We won't need faster than light travel. Light will travel fast enough for us. And we won't need anti-gravity, for a miniaturized ship will have close to zero mass. I can't believe all that. You couldn't believe miniaturization. I don't mean I can't believe the results of miniaturization. I mean I can't believe that the solution of the problem is permanently locked in the brain of one man. Others will eventually think of it. If not now, then next year or next decade. It's easy to wait when you are not concerned, Albert. The trouble is we're not going to have a next decade or even a next year. This grotto which you see all about you has cost the Soviet Union as much as a minor war. Each time we miniaturize anything. Even if it's just Katinka. We consume enough energy to last a sizable town for a whole day. Already, our government leaders look askance at this expense and many scientists, who do not understand the importance of miniaturization or who are simply selfish complain that all of Soviet science is being starved for the sake of the grotto. If we do not come up with a device to save on energy. An extreme saving, too. This place will be shut down. Nevertheless, Natalia, if you publish what is now known of miniaturization and make it available to the Global Association for the Advancement of Science, then innumerable scientists will put their minds to it and quickly enough someone will devise a method for coupling Planck's constant and the speed of light. Yes, said Boronova, and perhaps the scientist who will obtain the key of low energy miniaturization will be an American or a Frenchman or a Nigerian or a Uruguayan. It is a Soviet scientist who has it now and we don't want to lose the credit. Morrison said, you forget the Global Fellowship of Science. Don't cut it up into segments. You would speak differently if it were an American who was on the edge of the discovery and you were asked to do something that might possibly give the credit to one of us. Do you remember the history of the American reaction when the Soviet Union was the first to put an artificial satellite into orbit? Surely we have advanced since then. Yes, we have advanced a kilometer, but we have not advanced ten kilometers. The world is not yet entirely global in its thinking. There remains national pride to a considerable extent. So much the worse for the world. Still, if we are not global and if national pride is something we are expected to retain, then I should have mine. As an American, why should I be disturbed over a Soviet scientist losing credit for the discovery? I ask you only to understand the importance of this to us. I ask you to put yourself in our place for a moment and see if you can grasp our desperation to do what we can to find out what it is that Shaparov knows. Morrison said, All right, Natalia. I understand. I don't approve, but I understand. Now. Listen carefully, please. Now that I understand, what is it you want of me? We want you said Boronova intensely, to help us find out what Shaparov's thoughts, his still living and existing thoughts, are. How? There's nothing in my theory that makes that possible. Even granting that thinking networks do exist, and that brain waves can be minutely analyzed, and even granting that I occasionally get a mental image, possibly imaginary, possibly an artifact. 
there remains no way in which the brain waves can be studied to the extent of interpreting them in terms of actual thoughts. Not even if you could analyze, in detail, the brain waves of a single nerve cell that was part of a thinking network. I couldn't deal with a single nerve cell in anything approaching the necessary kind of detail. You forget. You can be miniaturized and be inside that single nerve cell. And Morrison stared at her in sick horror. She had mentioned something like this at their first meeting, but he had put it aside as nonsense. Horrifying, but nonsense, since miniaturization, he was certain, was impossible. But miniaturization was not impossible and now the horror was undiluted and paralyzing. 22. Morrison did not then, nor could he at any time afterward, clearly recall the events that immediately followed. It was not a case of everything going black as much as everything having blurred. His next clear memory was that of lying on a couch in a small office with Boronova looking down at him and with the other three. Dezhnyov, Kahinin, and Konyev. Behind her. Those three came into focus more slowly. He tried to struggle into a sitting position, but Konyev moved toward him and placed his hand on Morrison's shoulder. Please, Albert, rest a while. Gather your strength. Morrison looked from one to another in confusion. He had been upset, but he did not clearly remember what he had been upset about. What happened? How? How did I get here? He looked around the room again. No, he hadn't been here. He had been looking through a window at a man in a hospital bed. He said, puzzled, did I faint? Not really, said Boronova, but you weren't quite yourself for a while. You seemed to undergo a shock. Now Morrison remembered. Again he tried to lift himself into a sitting position, more strenuously this time. He struck Konyev's restraining hand out of the way. He was sitting up now, with his hands on the couch on either side of him. I remember now. You wanted me to be miniaturized. What happened to me when you said that? You simply swayed and... crumpled. I had you placed on a stretcher and brought here. It didn't seem to anyone that you needed medication, merely a chance to rest and recover. No medication. Morrison looked vaguely at his arms, as though he expected to see needle marks through the sleeve of his cotton blouse. None. I assure you. I didn't say anything before I collapsed. Not a word. Then let me answer you now. I'm not going to be miniaturized. Is that clear? It is clear that you say so. Dezhnyov sat down on the couch next to Morrison. He had a full bottle in one hand and an empty glass in the other. You need this, he said and half filled the glass. What is it? Asked Morrison, lifting his arm to ward it off. Vodka, said Dezhnyov. It's not medicinal, it's nourishing. I don't drink. There is a time for everything, my dear Albert. This is a time for a warming bit of vodka, even for those who do not drink. I don't drink out of disapproval. I can't drink. I have no head for alcohol, that's all. If I take two swallows of that, I will be drunk within five minutes. Completely drunk. Dezhnyov's eyebrows went up. So? What other purpose is there in drinking? Come. If you are lucky enough to win your goal in a few inexpensive sips, thank whatever you find thankable. A very small amount will warm you, stimulate your peripheral circulation, clear your head, concentrate your thoughts. It will even give you courage. Kahinan's voice sounded in half a whisper, but was distinctly audible. Do not expect miracles of a little alcohol. Morrison's head twisted sharply and he looked at her. She did not seem as pretty as he had thought her on their first meeting. There was a hard and unforgiving look about her. Morrison said, 
I have never represented myself as a courageous man. I have never presented myself as anything that would be of help to you. I have maintained from the beginning that I could not do anything for you. That I am here at all is the result of compulsion, as you all know. What do I owe you? What do I owe any of you? Boronova said, Albert, you are shivering. Take a sip of the vodka. You will not be drunk on a sip and we won't force more on you. Almost as though to show bravery in a small way, Morrison, after a moment's hesitation, took the glass from Dezhnyov's hand and swallowed a bit of the liquor recklessly. He felt a burning sensation in his throat, which passed. The taste was rather Swedish than otherwise. He took a larger sip and handed the glass back. Dezhnyov took it and placed it and the bottle on a small table on his side of the couch. Morrison tried to speak, but he coughed instead. He waited, cleared his throat, and said breathily, Actually, that's not so bad. If you don't mind, Arkady. Dash Dezhnyov reached for the glass, but Boronova said, No. That's enough, Albert. Her imperious gesture stopped Dezhnyov. We do not want you drunk, Albert. Just a little warm so you will listen to us. Morrison could feel the warmth rising within him, as it always had when, on rare occasions of social bonhomie, he had had some sherry or, once, a dry martini. He decided he could handle any argument she could produce. All right, he said, say on, and set his lips into a firm and unyielding line. I don't say, Albert, you owe us anything and I'm sorry that all this came as such a shock to you. We are aware that you are not a reckless man of action and we tried to break it to you as gently as possible. I had hoped, in fact, that you would see what was essential on your own, without any necessity of explanation. You were wrong said Morrison. At no time would such a mad thing have occurred to me. You see our necessity, don't you? I see your necessity. I don't see it as mine. You might feel you owe it to the cause of global science. Global science is an abstraction that I admire, but I am not likely to want to sacrifice my highly concrete body for an abstraction that doesn't seem to exist. The whole point of your necessity is that it is Soviet science that is at stake, not global science. Then consider American science, said Boronova, if you help us, that will become an eternal part of the victory. It will become a joint Soviet-American victory. Will my part be publicized? demanded Morrison. Or will the thing be announced as purely Soviet? Boronova said. You have my word. You cannot commit the Soviet government. Horrible, said Kahinen. He judges our government by his own. Konyev said, Wait, Natalia. Let me talk to our American friend, man to man. He sat down by Morrison and said, Albert, I appeal to your interest in your work. So far, you have achieved little in the way of results. You have convinced no one in your country and you don't have any chance of doing so as long as you are left with only the tools you have. We offer you a better tool, one whose worth you couldn't dream of three days ago and one which you'll never have again if you turn away from it now. Albert, you have the chance to graduate from romantic speculations to convincing evidence. Do this for us and you will become, at a bound, the most famous neurophysicist in the world. Morrison said, you're asking me to risk my life on an untried technique. That is not unprecedented. All through history, scientists have risked death to continue their investigations. They have gone up in balloons and have dipped under the seas in primitive armored spheres to make their measurements and observations. Chemists have risked dealing with poisons and explosives, biologists with pathogens of all types. Physicians have injected themselves with experimental sera and physicists, in attempting to establish a self-supporting nuclear reaction, 
knew well that the explosion that resulted might destroy them or, conceivably, the entire planet. Morrison said, You spin dreams. You would never let it be known that an American played a role. Not when you confess your desperation at the possibility that Soviet science would lose the credit. Konyev said, Let's be honest with each other, Albert. We couldn't hide your share in this, even if we wished to. The American government knows we brought you here. We know they do. You know they do. They made no move to stop us because they want you here. Well, they will know. Or at least guess. What we wanted you here for and what you did for us, once we announce our success. And they will see to it that American science, in your person, will get full credit. Morrison sat silently, head bent, for a while. There was a flushed spot, high on each cheek, as a result of the vodka he had drunk. Without looking, he knew that four pairs of eyes were firmly fixed upon him and he suspected that four breaths were being held. He looked up and said, Let me ask you one question. How did Shaparov come to be in a coma? There was again a silence and three of the pairs of staring eyes shifted to Natalia Boronova. Morrison, seeing that, also stared at her. Well. He said. Boronova said, Albert, I will tell you the truth, even if that would tend to defeat our aims. If we try to lie to you, you will be right not to believe anything we say. If you see we are truthful, then you can believe us in the future. Albert, academician Shaparov is in a coma because he was miniaturized, as we hope you will be. There was a small accident during demiaturizing that destroyed part of his brain, apparently permanently. That can happen, you see, and we are not hiding it from you. Now give us the credit for utter frankness and say you will help us. 6. Decision We are always certain that the decision we have just made is wrong. Dezhnyov Sr. 23 Now, finally, Morrison rose, feeling a trifle unsteady on his feet. Whether from the vodka, from the general tension of the day, or from this last revelation he did not know or care. He stamped his feet a little, as though to firm them, then deliberately walked the length of the small room and back. He faced Boronova and said in a harsh voice, you can miniaturize a rabbit and nothing seems to happen to it. Did it occur to you that the human brain is the most complex bit of matter we know and that, whatever else might survive, the human brain might not? It did, said Boronova stolidly, but all our investigations have shown us that miniaturization does not in the least affect the interrelationships within the object being miniaturized. In theory, even the human brain would not be affected by miniaturization. In theory, said Morrison with contempt. How is it possible that, based on theory alone, you would experiment with Shaparov, whose brain you seem to value so highly? And having failed with him, to your enormous loss, how can you be so mad as to propose experimenting with me to recover that loss? You'll simply fail with me, too and I cannot accept that. Dezhnyov said, Don't speak nonsense. We are not mad. Nothing we did was lightly undertaken. The fault was Shaparov's. Boronova said, In a way, it was. Shaparov had his eccentric ways. Crazy Peter I believe you call him in English and that is perhaps not so far off. He was intent on having the miniaturization experience. He was getting old, he said, and he would not, like Moses, reach the promised land without entering it. He might have been forbidden to do so. By me? I would forbid Shaparov? You can't be serious. Not you. Your government. If the miniaturization process is so precious to the Soviet Union, Dash Shaparov threatened to abandon the project altogether if he did not have his way and that could not be risked. Nor is our government quite so high-handed as it once was in its pressures on troublesome scientists. 
It must take world opinion into greater account now, as your government must. It is the price of global cooperation. Whether that is for the better or for the worse, I cannot say. In any case, Shaparov was eventually miniaturized. Morrison muttered, absolutely mad. No, said Boronova, for we did not move without precautions. Despite the fact that every exercise in miniaturization is costly and sends shivers through the Central Coordinating Committee, we insisted on a careful approach. Twice we miniaturized chimpanzees and twice we brought them back and could detect no changes in them. Either as a result of minute studies of their behavior or by magnetic resonance imaging of the brain. A chimpanzee is not a human being, said Morrison. Something we were aware of, said Boronova gravely. Therefore, we miniaturized a human being next. A volunteer. Yuri Konyev, to be precise. Konyev said, it had to be me. It was I who felt most strongly that the human brain would not be affected. I am the neurophysicist of the project and it was I who made the necessary calculations. I would not ask another human being to risk his sanity on my calculations and my certainty. Life is one thing. We all lose it sooner or later. Sanity is quite another. So brave, whispered Kahinen, looking at her fingertips, the deed of a true Soviet hero. Her lip trembled, as though on the brink of a sneer. Looking firmly at Morrison, Konyev said, I am a loyal Soviet citizen, but I did not do it for nationalist motives. They would be, in this case, irrelevant. I did it as a matter of decency and of scientific ethics. I had confidence in my analysis and of what worth was my confidence if I would not risk myself on it. And it is a matter of something else, too. When the history of miniaturization is recorded, I will be listed as the first human being ever to have been subjected to the process. That will eclipse the deeds of a great-granduncle of mine who was a general fighting the German Nazis in the Great Patriotic War. And I would be pleased with that, not out of vainglory but out of a belief that the conquests of peace should always be held superior to victories in war. Boronova said, well, putting ideals to one side and passing on to the facts. Yuri was miniaturized twice. Audiobook generated by, read with the ears.